Hey guys and welcome to Taylor Tech. So today we're going to have another huge lab upgrade and we'll be diving into Cisco UCS using these servers right here as, a, as talking points and examples. You may not be familiar with Cisco UCS um, or you may have seen the servers and wonder uh, why they seem like they're always cheaper a little bit than any of the other common servers out there like HP or Dell. We're going to go over what makes these servers unique and how the management interfaces for these servers probably lead them to be a little bit cheaper. And then finally, um, you know, how useful these are in the home lab. So let's go through all of that. So Cisco UCS. What the UCS actually stands for is Unified Compute System. And that's pretty easy to find um, if you look around online a little bit. but it doesn't really make a lot of sense if you take it too literally because the reality is Cisco kind of forgot some words in the name and um, it makes a lot more sense what Cisco UCS is if you extend the name to Cis to Unified Network for a Compute System because really that's what Cisco UCS is. Um, what they've done is they've taken some pretty relatively standard um, servers, rack mount servers and blade systems and put some really kind of cool networking on them and cool management for them um, that allows you to do uh, interesting things that aren't really possible with uh, a more traditional Dell or HP system. The most interesting thing they do with the networking is that they allow hardware level virtualization of your network. So Cisco has these adapter cards that are designed specifically for these servers called VIX, Virtual Interface Cards that allow that have physical ports on them in the case of the rack mount servers or just or mezzanine cards in the case of the blade servers and uh, allow you to create virtual NICs that are presented to the operating system as if they were a physical NIC. So the operating system has no knowledge of the fact that it's being virtualized. That lets you do some really cool stuff, in my opinion, in terms of being able to add NICs to a server, if you to a base OS install. Um, if you realize suddenly that you need an additional NIC for an additional VLAN to you know segment out part of your network, you can do that with UCS with the host OS being none the wiser and not having to actually change any of your physical hardware. The easiest comparison I can make for what it's like to manage these uh, these virtual NICs in uh, the UCS servers is that it's kind of like managing vSwitches in a hypervisor install like ESXi or uh, Hyper-V. You can create them at will and you can remove them at will and you can do things like set, virtual, uh, set VLANs on them um, and that kind of thing. So it really lets you have really fine grained control over the network for a machine. So, and the other thing is it's not just limited to Ethernet. While you do have your standard Ethernet NIC and LAN setups that you can uh, create for these servers, you can also create uh, virtual HBAs to uh, do fiber channel um, uh, connections from the servers. So if you um, wanted to have a fiber channel setup, but you didn't want to buy a bunch of extra fiber channel hardware, you could actually virtualize it all using UCS servers and uh, VIX. So what all goes into a UCS environment and to running a UCS server? Well, the first thing to understand is you can run them in one of two ways. You can either run them as part of a UCS domain under a Fabric Interconnect, or you can run them in standalone mode. Standalone mode is more or less what it sounds like. It's just the server by itself. So you don't really need any extra hardware for it for running a UCS server. In fact, you don't even necessarily need a VIC card to run a UCS server um, to have networking on it. You can use any standard PCIe card on them. They just won't have that additional layer of uh, network virtualization that uh, Cisco includes. When you're running them in standalone mode, the management system that you're using is something called SIMC, uh, Cisco Integrated Management Controller, I believe is the correct acronym. We'll see it here in a second on the screen. And this is very similar to something like IDRAC or ILO um, with the addition of having really just more options of what you can do with it. So the other option besides standalone mode is actually running your server as part of a UCS domain. Um, the interface for managing it there is called UCS Manager, or UCSM, and um, there's a lot more though that goes into it on, a hardware, on the hardware side. You can't just have the server by itself. You need the server, 
you need a Cisco VIC in the server. Um, so you need one of Cisco's networking cards in it. You need a Fabric Interconnect, to, which is really kind of the brains of a UCS domain um, and is where UCS Manager resides. And then you need, if you're having rack mount servers, uh, you need a what's called a FEX, a Fabric Extender between the Fabric Interconnect and this rack mount server. Um, if you have Blade servers, um, you can connect them directly because they have a FEX built into the back of them. Essentially what the UCS domain lets you do is have many uh, UCS servers or Blade systems uh, underneath the control of either one or two fabric interconnects. And then those fabric interconnects are connected to all of your upstream lands and SANs and allows those uh, networks to connect to the UCS servers using that network virtualization layer that they've built in. Um, that lets you do some really, really interesting things. Um, I'm gonna talk at the very end about a project that I have planned for these guys um, using that, that setup um, that I'm actually really excited about. So as you can see, I don't have a blade system uh, here in front of me. Um, if I did, it'd probably be blocking me entirely. And quite frankly, my wallet, my ears, and my power bill are all very thankful that I don't have a blade system because I'd probably actually try and run it and that would probably just not be good. I'd probably get kicked out. The, these two servers right here actually represent two different generations of UCS. Um, just like with um, HP's different gen servers and Dell's different generations of PowerEdge, um, you have different generations of UCS. Now it's a newer system than either of those, so we'll, we'll kind of see that as we go through these servers. First, let's talk about this guy. So this is a UCS C200 M2. So the M2 generation is their Nellum-based um, LGA1366 uh, socket. Uh, system. It's very analogous to like a, a Dell, uh, uh, the R, the, uh, what is it, the R uh, X10 series, which is, I believe, the Gen 11, Generation 11, I believe, and uh, or to an HP uh, Gen 7 server. So you've got your uh, 5500 series and 5600 series processors that you can run in them. They're DDR3. Um, but only up to 1066 speed. Um, so the this right here is the 1U version. They also had a 2U and a 4U. Um, or was it 4U or 3U? You know, and basically the same thing that you're gonna hear uh, with one of those HP or Dell systems applies to one of these older M2 series. They're gonna be less power efficient. They're gonna have less overall horsepower, um, even with higher end processors in them. Um, you're going to be a little bit limited on how much memory you can put into them. Um, and, you know, they're probably going to age out in your lab a lot faster. Um, if you're looking to build something up long term and you wouldn't buy an HP Gen 7 or, uh, a, you know, like an R710 or something like that or an R610, um, then you probably want to go ahead and skip over the M2s and go straight to the M3s. Um, that said, they can be had really, really cheap. Um, they can be can have pre-configured really, really cheap. Uh, especially if you're looking around on deals on eBay, I've seen systems with memory processor. You know, all you need to add is rails and a and a um, and a network card, a VIC, and you're good to go for under $150 shipped, which is just phenomenal because that means that like two thirds of the cost is the shipping. One down, big downside to these servers, though, at least with the 200 series um, or with the the one U versions, is that they. Uh, are not going to be as nice as something like uh, like a, a Dell, a similar generation PowerEdge or HP server. Um, they're not that service that easily serviceable. Um, there's very little in terms of toolless um, uh, toollessness within them. You know, even getting out the uh, PCIe riser requires removing a screw. It, you know, all the cards are individually screwed into the PCIe riser. The fans are all screwed in and have uh, have wiring that runs over to the board where they plug in. So replacing a fan is kind of a pain in the butt. Um, the covers are all kind of square and angular and not really fitted very well. So it's really kind of frustrating. Um, and most frustrating of all is the actually the cover on this guy is a royal pain in the ass to get off. Like I honestly have to like beat on it most some of the times to get the cover to start sliding because it just doesn't, you don't have anything to really get purchase on it. And um, it, it uses like a friction lock that you can see right here that you have to, there's like one tab lock and the rest of it's just friction. So it's really a pain in the butt. They give you a little rubber grippy here to help you push it off, but it's useless. It's really useless. So anyway, that's the M2s. The M3s are, um, they're going to be more similar to like uh, the 
was it either 12th or 13th generation i wish i could remember what those were off the top of my head um the uh the rx 200 series so seven or the 720s or the 620s from dell or an hp gen 8 um so you have uh either sandy bridge or ivy bridge based xeons in there with um you know ddr3 more options in terms of ddr3 speed um, and similar to the Dells and the HPs, you also have a PCIe power header in uh, at least the 2U and above servers for plugging in uh, GPUs. So you could actually run a GPU in one of these systems. Also, the, they, they did a massive update to the physical layout of these guys. Um, the every, Everything is much more toolless in terms of like the PCIe risers come out toollessly, the fans come out toollessly, CPUs come out toollessly. It's all much more serviceable. They actually even improved the cover, the way the cover comes off. Um, you know, it's got a, a single screw lock in the back that's uh, easy to remove and actually gives you something to grip and pull on uh, when you're trying to pull it off. So you're not just doing that friction push and watching your hand slide across the smooth metal top. Um, you have something to grip with and it makes it a lot easier to get these covers off. Um, the only thing I don't like that they changed is the way that the uh, hard drive caddies work. So if you look at the hard drive caddies on the M2s, they're nice, solid things. They're not gonna break, they're not flimsy. You screw your drive in and you know it's in there well. But when you look at the caddies on the M3s, they're much more flimsy. They're kind of a pain to get on. Here you just drop the drive in and it's sitting in there and it's easy to screw in. Here you're kind of like balancing it and holding it and trying to get it screwed in without it while this is wobbling around on you. So not a fan of how these guys uh, were changed, but I understand they probably needed to make a little more space. So we already talked about how the prices on these are relatively cheap compared to their competition um, from Dell and HP in the used market. Um, the M3s are also likewise much, much cheaper than their Dell or HP counterparts. Um, so the base price, the lowest you're gonna see something like an R620 uh, from Dell or uh, a, you know, a, um, a 1U uh, Gen 8 HP server, is going to be at least seven or eight hundred dollars with like maybe one cpu or no cpus at all and it's cto and you have to you know get all the parts uh separately whereas these guys you know the the c220s the one u version of the m3s are about 270 for a cto for one that has that you just have to add processor and ram and disk to um and the uh, you know higher spec ones you know something that's got um dual eight core and 64 gigs of RAM is going to run you under six, $700, which is really amazing, um, you know, to get that Sandy Bridge. Uh, it's really amazing getting E5 processors, the Sandy Bridge processors in that much RAM in a system um, compared to what you're going to, you're going to pay at least double that for an HP or a Dell system. Uh, the only downside really to these servers compared to their counterparts with Dell and HP is that they um, are a lot pickier in terms of hardware compatibility and the aftermarket for parts is a lot smaller. Um, right now, there's, I think, a single person on eBay selling these uh, these caddies for the M3 large form factor. I mean, there's a million of them selling them for small form factor, but if you've got a large form factor server, there's one guy selling them and he wants $20 a pop. Uh, you know, the rails are really hard to come by. There is literally one person selling the rails for this guy right now and I actually need to buy some. And there's nobody selling cable management arms for this guy at all. I found one cable management arm for this guy, fortunately. Um, but yeah, it's just, you're, you're gonna have a harder time coming across parts for them. And again, like I said earlier, parts compatibility is an issue. The the back planes on these guys, the, the drive back planes, have a very limited number of RAID cards that they work with. It's basically one Cisco RAID card and a handful of LSI ones. Um, <clears throat> so you're going to be limited on options. Um, and before you would purchase one of these, I'd highly recommend that you double check the, the compatibility matrices that Cisco puts out on their website to make sure that the way that they've configured the server for you, whoever's selling it, makes sense and will actually function. When I picked up my M3 here, um, the seller didn't have a RAID card in it and had it plugged in directly to the motherboard's uh, SAS headers. But when you look at Cisco's compatibility matrix, the the onboard SAS headers are only for if you have the small form factor that's the, the half size, the one that doesn't have the extender for the full front uh, being filled in with drives. You know, the large form factor has to have a RAID card. There's actually only two RAID cards that work with the large form factor and they were gonna take the RAID card out of it. 
So um, that that's a problem. You need to make sure that you do your research before you buy these guys because you could end up with a system that doesn't seems like it doesn't work, and it's because someone has inadvertently misconfigured it for you. That said, I feel like these guys are still a really good value for the home lab um, because it, one, you can either get started really really cheap, or you can get into LGA twenty eleven and Sandy Bridge and Ivory Bridge processors much cheaper. Um, you know, to give you an example, this server right here I actually picked up for about four hundred and seventy bucks shipped, um, and it came with a single uh, what is it an E five twenty six twenty something like that. It was uh, it's a lower spec processor. It's four core eight thread, sixteen gigs of RAM, um, but you know it it was much cheaper than I could have possibly gotten an LGA twenty eleven from Dell or HP. Um, and so, yeah, so I think they represent a really good value still. Plus, there's also some really neat things that you can do with them that we're going to talk about here as we go through SIMC and UCSM and talk about how you manage these guys. So first, let's talk about managing these as standalone servers, not part of a UCS environment, because that's how most people are probably going to do it. So SIMC is the out-of-band management tool that Cisco gives you. And like I said earlier, it's very, very similar to ILO or iDRAC with the exception of you can just do more with it. Because even in standalone mode, not a part of a UCS domain, you have more options in terms of like adding VNIX on the fly to the server. What we're gonna do is we're gonna hop over to uh, SimC on the computer and just kind of do a real quick menu walkthrough. All right, guys, so let's go ahead and go through uh, SimC and uh, so you get an idea what it looks like. So we'll hop over here, whoops, and then and the default password is password. If I can type, apparently I can. It's a good day when I can type. Okay, so we're getting loaded up here. So the basic layout here um, is that you've got your server summary here in the middle. This is the active, you know, whatever you're actively working on. These buttons across the top are always the same. Your reset, boot shutdown KVM and help buttons um, you can see right here everything is green we're all good um, and then we uh, have two tabs over here that have all the menus on them the server tab and the admin tab so the admin tab is everything related to SimC itself not to the server so you've got the users for SimC for that have the ability to manage the server from the management uh, console here You've got whether it's connected to Active Directory and what the active sessions are. You've got the network settings for SIMC. So which adapters is it using? In this case, the LAN, uh, the LAN on motherboard adapters. There's also a dedicated NIC that you can use if you want to use the LOMs for actual connectivity and a separate Cisco card, which we haven't one installed. Um, and then what kind of network security you want to use. Um, what, again, more networking settings, what's enabled, what's not. Certificates if you want to install a certificate so that you don't have uh, issues like I'm having with uh, broken security. The SIMC log, who logged in, who logged out, when it server SIMC turned on or turned off. Um, event management, what to do if something happens. Um, shut down, you do things like shut down the server or uh, reboot it, that kind of thing. Uh, managing the firmware and then of course utilities for things like exporting your configuration which is great for doing backups. Um, next we have uh, on the server page, we've got of course our summary, our inventory for the server. So like what physical devices are there? What are your CPUs, your memory, your power supplies, network adapter, storage, PCI adapter. So we'll look at storage and network real quick because those two are more interesting to me based on what I've seen with others. Um, the storage adapter is really kind of cool because it shows you um, more than most systems so um, it tells you of course what your uh, storage adapter is is it the onboard is it the in this case the raid card that we have installed um, you can look at the actual physical drives get information on them you know you've got some smart stats down here to give you an idea of what's going on with the drive um, and then you also have virtual drive info so it actually is telling you what volume virtual volumes you've created what the, you know, what the state is, the size, the RAID level, which uh, physical drives are a part of them. So this is basically all the information you get from going into the RAID controller itself. And then of course, battery backup information. And as you can see, my battery backup's dead and I need a new one. Um, and then network adapters. Again, this is really cool. 
Um, like we talked about with the, the VIX, with the virtual interface cards, you can actually create additional NICs, like virtual NICs on top of um, the, uh, the ones that are, uh, so, so you don't, if you have two ports, that doesn't mean you just have two NICs that the server has available, you actually have additional NICs available. So we're gonna boot the server up so we can look at the network adapter information. So here we can see the adapter, um, give it a minute to go through its post and then you'll see the uh, actually the all the VNIX that are on it. Okay, so now that the server's booted up, we can see our VNIX. You can see I've got one plugged in, one's not plugged in. And on the VNIX page, we can see you know, how many VNIX that are there. We can actually go ahead and add another one, give it a name, tell it which port we're using, zero or one for that VNIX. Um, we can set it so that it has, uh, was it a trunk VLAN or an access VLAN? And then what, uh, what's the actual VLAN for it? Um, so it's really, really kind of cool and powerful concept like we talked about previously. Um, let's see. And then let's go through the rest of the server menu real quick. You, of course, have your sensors um, that tell you what the status of it is. Uh, you can see we only have one power supply plugged in because the other one, for some reason, trips my breaker. I don't, it's a different brand than the other three that I have in the two servers, whatever. Um, look at voltages temperatures amperage um, you know just all sorts of information you know LEDs if you want to know which LEDs are on um, it's really kind of I don't know it's funny to me uh, you've got your system event logs to so this lo logs all of the system events not just uh, errors um, let's see remote presence lets you actually you know like do a KVM session which for right now I'm having problems with the KVM session I'm gonna try and do it again. Do, do, do. This can go away. Let's rename this guy. Yes. Later. Love when Java puts out an update after you started recording a video. It's like, for real Java? I swear every 15 minutes. Every 15 minutes. Um, this does take them just a second to boot. There we go. So you can see we have a KVM session and my hypervisor that's there. I can throw control at delete at it and log in so that I can actually do my normal KVM stuff here. And you have full, uh, full control over it um, just like you would um, in any other KVM session. Um, here you can actually add virtual media. So a lot of other like, you know, iDRAC and ILO allow you to mount virtual media, but generally you have like one thing you can mount. Not the case with SimC. You can add lots of images and have many, many things mounted at once if you need to have, for some reason, four or five different you know, ISOs mounted. Um, it's a very simple process. Uh, you can go, you can create an image, tell it what you want to mount. Let's go to uh, downloads. Taylor versus downloads. Got some ISOs in there, I think. File type open. So you can mount a whole folder. Oh wait, that's creating an image. Let's add an image. So you can create an image out of a folder and mount it. You can add an image. You can remove one when you're done with it. So let's go downloads. So here I can just grab one, mount it. It's mounting it as a, as a uh, CD. And reloading it, mapped. Okay. So I'm telling it to map it. Now I can come over to my KVM. Go away. Updates everywhere. And now I think it's E. Dir. You can see I have my mounted disk there that I just mounted. So, um, and you can see this is the, the same thing that I mounted here. It's my hardware update utility for this server. So. Um, very, very handy, very cool that you can have multiple things mounted and mapped. Um, you can, you have these three different devices you can map to at any given time. So you can have many images here and just say, oh, click, I want to mount that one, I want to mount this one. Very cool. So awesome KVM utility. Let's go ahead and close it now that we're done. All right. So next you have BIOS, which is even better than having a KVM because you can actually manage the entire BIOS for the server 
from within SimC. You can come and actually configure the BIOS parameters just like you were booting the server. So you can um, come in here, set BIOS options, um, and like literally 80, 90% of what you can do from the BIOS itself is right here. Um, really kind of cool. I think it's, I think this is probably one of my favorite things. You can also reconfigure the boot order. So you can see here's what the boot order is. And if I don't like it, I can come here okay, and I can actually edit what the boot order is. Um, and if for some reason I'm having a problem, I need to clear CMOS on it. No jumpers. There's a button for it right there. And if the BIOS is corrupt, I can click recover corrupt BIOS and it'll load a new, it'll flash a new BIOS to it and you're all good to go. Um, Power policies also has some cool options. Um, if you have an environment where you're really power constrained, so you're on a 15 amp breaker and you've got like six servers, and if one of them throttles up too much or two or three of them throttle up at the same time, you're screwed, you can enable power capping and say this server can only pull 240 watts, never allowed to pull more, and if that happens, then throttle it down till it stops pulling 240 watts. Um, and so that way you can really manage your power a lot better than uh, you know with some servers where they'll just spin up and start pulling four or 500 watts and uh, put you in a, a tight situation or give you a tight power bill that you weren't expecting. Um, last tab here, yes, discard, is uh, fault sensors. So this is telling you what are your active faults on the server. Um, so right now we have no faults, uh, but if you had faults, it would list what they were up here. Um, so the discrete sensors are things like missing hardware, threshold sensors are things like over temperature or uh, over voltage, uh, attempting to go over wattage, that kind of thing. So that hopefully that gives you a good overview of what SIMC is like. Okay, so there's one more thing I actually forgot to do when we were going through SIMC, so let's do that real quick. And that is, um, there's actually an alternative way to connect if you can't get to the web interface. Um, and this is another thing that's really nice about uh, SIMC compared to uh, IDRAC and ILO, because as far as I know, they don't have this. Uh, the, SIMC actually has an SSH interface. So if for some reason the web interface isn't working or you're just a command line interface kind of guy, you can connect directly through SSH. And we're gonna log into the admin. Use our super secure default password and we're in. And the interface works very similar to NXOS or UCSM if you've used either of those. Um, it's closer to UCSM than NXOS for obvious reasons, I would think. Um, so uh, you can see you've got your scope, you've got uh, different things you can do. The, probably the most important thing is um, the ability to reset SIMC from the SSH interface. So uh, we can go to scope uh, of SIMC. And then from the scope of SIMC, you have the option of reboot. And that reboots the SIMC servers. So that's the little interface for SIMC. You can reboot it from this command line interface. That's really useful, especially if you're having problems with logging into the web interface. If you try and load it and it freezes or it hangs, or you know, I've had problems like when I'm going from UCSM to SIMC and you know, removing it from that UCS environment, um, UCS manager environment it doesn't always work quite right until you reboot it once. Um, so instead of having to walk over and physically unplug and replug in the server, you can just come here and go to SIMC and run a reboot. And there you go. You can also change your network settings for SIMC from here. You can set all the fact, you can put it back to factory defaults. defaults. Um, I just want to show that real quick and let you know that that is an option if you're having problems with the web interface or if um, for some reason you're just not a web interface kind of guy, you'd rather use a command line interface. So if you're not going to use SIMC, the other option is to manage the server as part of a UCS domain. Um, and really, the thing to understand about that, if you're going to do it that way, is one, you're you're committing upfront to a um, a much larger power draw in terms of networking. Now you're going to have a lot of networking options, obviously, but you're committing to a large power draw because the reality is, UCSM was designed for the data center. It was designed so that uh, a Fabric Interconnect was managing tons of servers. Like it's not unreasonable to talk about an FI managing over a hundred rack mounts. And uh, you just, you gotta understand you're gonna very, you're probably gonna be spending as much electric bill on your networking as you are on the servers themselves. Um, so just bear that in mind. It's also going to be loud because the, uh, especially the Fabric Interconnects are screamers. They're really loud. If you didn't see my video where I had my Fabric Interconnect out with a microphone in front of it, um, I'll just, I'll play a quick clip of it 
And uh, wait, Taylor, that's not that loud. I'm. Uh, we got the microphone right in front of it. And it's just... Yeah, there you go. Once the fans actually kick on, it's pretty damn loud. The cool thing, though, is that because it is designed for managing servers at scale, it gives you a ton of options. There's so many things that you can do in UCS Manager that you just can't do either in standalone mode or that you can't do even with some of the, the other tools that uh, that you have from Dell or HP for managing at scale. Um, and the, the really nice thing, and the which is odd to say for Cisco, um, if you have the hardware, there's no licensing. I know that might be a shocker for some people, but um, if you have the, the UCS hardware, if you have the fabric and it connects the facts and everything, you don't need any additional licensing to kind of dig in and understand how their management infrastructure works. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna jump into UCS Manager and kind of go through that real quick and talk about it um, from the interface. So let's do that. All right, so now that we've gone through uh, SimC, let's go through UCS Manager. Now, if you have more than just one or two UCS servers, you're probably gonna want some of the features that come with UCS Manager because um, to be frank, it's really, really nice. Uh, let's see. And then... So what UCS Manager is, is really the management interface for a lot of, UC, of UCS servers. Um, here we go. So let's go ahead and full screen this guy. So it's kind of similar to SimC, but it's not because it's got a much broader scope. So over here, um, the, your ta it's kind of broken out into tabs here. You've got your equipment, your servers, your LAN settings, your SAN settings, VM settings, storage settings, and the administration tab. The real major ones are the equipment, servers, and LAN. Um, if you have a SAN like that you're running, you can, obviously those settings are available there. The VM settings I won't really get into because I don't have um, you know, an SS SCCM in uh, server for managing my hypervisors, which is necessary for that. Um, and then, of course, the admin settings. Of course, you have your user management. You can set it up with LD, with LDAP um, or Radius um, so that it imports all your users. There's um, and you can. You, I haven't done that yet, but that is something that you can do. So you have um, you know stats collection management, all your faults. Um, you know, you can set up the uh, management interfaces for the uh, Fabric Interconnect here. So if you need to modify that. Um, and then down here, you have this compatibility catalog. And that's actually kind of nice because as we talked about previously, uh, UCS servers are sensitive when it comes to what hardware you put in them. And Cisco is kind enough for people who are managing lots of these to go ahead and give you all the information of what's compatible and what's not. Uh, and it does this based off of the version of UCS Manager that you're running. So let's hop back over the equipment tab. This basically, this lists out all of your physical equipment that you have uh, hooked up to your, to your UCS environment. Um, it's broken down into chassis, which are your blade chassis, uh, rack mounts, which are your C-series rack mount servers, here you'll notice there's two things within it. There's FEX and then servers because um, you have to have a FEX to act as the intermediary between your C-series servers and the Fabric Interconnect. You can't plug them directly in unless you have some newer hardware, uh, which I don't have. And then you've got the Fabric Interconnects themselves. One of the really nice things about UCS Manager um, is this firmware management. Now I wanna talk about that real quick because it makes it super easy to manage all the firmware on all your servers all at once. So when something like, oh, I don't know, Spectre Meltdown comes along and they send you a new patch for all of your ancient freaking servers, um, you can apply it to them all at once. Uh, you simply come, you um, get your firmware, you um, do the download and bring it into your UCS server, um, and then you can apply it. Um, you can set it to auto install. What, what firmware is it gonna auto install across your devices for UCS manager, for rack mounts, um, for your fabric interconnect. Um, and it will, whenever you plug in a server and discover it, it will automatically put that firmware on it for you, which is really, really nice um, because it kind of sucks to have to go through and update servers one by one with firmware. Um, another thing is that once you have all your servers in, you can actually see a topology view. It's not really that useful. If you had a more complex network with lots of servers, I could see how it could be useful, but for me, with just a handful of UCS servers, not terribly useful. So previously we talked about FEXs, so this is basically a, a 
dumber than dumb switch. It's not even, you know, um, on its own, it doesn't do anything. It has to be connected to a management device. So we can see from the FEX display here, it gives you a physical overview of what's actually plugged in and what's actually connected. This is really nice because you can see what ports are physically connected, what's uh, actually up. So if you're ever wondering, is that actually plugged in? Does it recognize it? Whatever, you can actually see that dis displayed here. And it does that for all devices, including the Fabric Interconnect. Oops. So you can see what's actually plugged in. I don't have much plugged into the Fabric Interconnect right now. It does it for the servers themselves, although it doesn't give you the network information on the servers because that's a little bit different. So actually, let's talk about Discovery real quick. So you'll notice that when uh, the server wasn't working, I came in here, went re clicked Recover Server, and told it to re-acknowledge. What that does is that rediscovers the server. And what Discovery is, is the process of going through, current FSM name is Discover, um, it goes through and it does like a deep probe of all of the hardware to understand what exactly is on that server. Um, so this is really important for UCS Manager because UCS Manager is managing the resources at a much lower level. Just like we saw with SIMC where it's managing all the resources of the server um, at a lower level than you know you typically get with something like ILO or IDRAC. Um, you're doing the same thing with UCS Manager but you're doing it at scale. Um, and we'll go through that here in a second when we talk, talk about servers and service profiles. Um, but essentially the way it works is you have your servers and those servers are associated to service profiles and those service profiles are a definition of all of the, the virtual interfaces, all of the uh, uh, hard drive configuration, um, you know, what the, what the LUNs are on it, um, you know, any power restrictions, all that information is stored in the service profile so you can just apply that and you can create a template for a service profile and apply that quickly to servers as you bring them in. Um, in theory, you could take a server that is completely unconfigured, fresh out of the box from Cisco, slap it in your rack, plug it in, get in UCS Manager, apply a profile to it, and start installing your operating system within like 15 minutes. I actually saw a video on YouTube one time where I think someone did it in 11 minutes. Um, so, you know, it's really, really nice if, uh, if you're managing things at scale. So while we're waiting for Discovery to finish on that, let's go ahead and let's run through um, what we have here on the server. So just like we had um, in uh, SIMC, we have uh, the inventory for the server, which lists all of the physical devices on it. Um, you know, you've got your motherboard, SIMC information, um, CPUs, GPUs, memory. Um, adapters are inter network interface cards. So um, in NICs are your actual virtual NICs, your VNICs. They just call them NICs here for some reason. Of course, your storage shows you the controller, what the LUNs are, and then what the actual disks are within that LUN. Now, this display is kind of cool. This hybrid display shows you the actual f linkage back to the Fabric Interconnect. So you can see this port and this port are connected to... Really? Are those cross-connected? That's weird. Are connected to these ports on the... Uh, on the FEX and then the FEX is connected back. So you know the exact pathway that a server is taking. So it's still going through discovery. Um, this is kind of one of the only unfortunate things is it does take a few minutes to get through discovery, but once you get through discovery, it's all relatively fast. Association of a service profile doesn't take very long for it to copy all that configuration uh, information. So you'll notice there's not a ton of actual like configuration and changing uh, like you saw with SIMC in this view here, in this equipment view. And that's because it's expected that you'll do all that through service profiles and not on the equipment directly. So the idea being that you create a service profile and that service profile represents um, the, the actual usage of the server or the, what the, the process that's being used. And then the servers become essentially commodities that can be plugged in and associated with that service profile and off you go. But what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna come over to the service profile and we're gonna look at what these service profiles are. So these have to be configured on a per server basis. You can create templates that have like, say you have, I know I have a VNIC for my main LAN, my main LAN. I have a, um, a management VNIC, and I have, uh, you know, I don't know, some other VNIC, and those are common across all my servers. Well, I can have a template that has those built into it, has maybe a basic storage configuration built into it, and then I can uh, use that template to create a service profile off of. Um, alternatively, you can create it based off of the physical hardware, um, you know, and just tell, tell UCS Manager, whatever the hardware is currently set at, make me a service profile that's that. Um, 
So, you know, um, there's a couple different ways to create them, but essentially the service profile is where you're doing the actual configuration of the server. This is where you can come in and get super nitty gritty and detailed on what are all your virtual host bus adapters, what are your storage profile, you can change the physical storage profile for the server. Um, I haven't done this for most of these servers um, because I'm leaving things pretty basic. It, it gets really nitty gritty, guys. It gets almost annoyingly nitty gritty. You can see here I've got two virtual NICs on one physical connection. Um, one is for my main WAN, the uh, main LAN, the other is for the WAN because um, I'm working on setting up a, a, a dual uh, PFSense, um, a CARP failover across two hosts uh, on different hypervisors. It's going to be really cool because it's going to be like super turtles all the way down. Um, everything's going to be virtualized. It, um, I'm really excited about that one. Uh, you can set the boot order just like we saw with SimC. Policies is where you would control like power, you know, like what's the power, max power usage. And a lot of this, you'll notice that a lot of this uh, stuff, you're selecting something, a domain, another policy. And you can see all these policies down here. You can define a whole series of policies. And this is where this gets really crazy because you can have... 15 different policies and they're associated with different cert with different templates that are associated with different profiles and you change one policy down here and it applies to all these different servers um, and that's that's something that's really powerful you know uh, if you've got say one policy that's for all your hypervisors that limits their that throttles them based on power draw so that they don't draw so much power and then you find out ooh, you know I need to squeeze a few more watts out of my lab you can go and change that one policy and it applies across all your service profiles um, so again, it's man it's for managing servers at scale, which is, I think is cool, but is obviously way more complicated. There's the concept of pools in UCSM where you have a, a group of IDs and you can assign it. So this would be really handy if you had a really big environment and you wanted everything that was a hypervisor to come from pool A and everything that was a storage device to come from pool B and everything that was, so that way you could kind of like logically separate them and just look at like the ID for something or the IP for something and know what it was. Um, again, at my scale with three servers, it's not worth it, but you do have to have them set up for it to, to function. So you have unique IDs for the servers from one to A is of course in hexadecimal. Uh, -da. In LAN, you've got your IP pool, which is for management. Um, there's this UCS main pool, although it's not really being assigned. It's being pulled by the switch. I don't know why I created that one. Honestly, this one can go away. Really, the management pool is what's important here. The management interfaces on the devices are assigned from that pool. The Mac pool is where it's pulling Mac addresses for management and the network uh, interfaces. So. While we're here, though, in the LAN tab, let's go over the rest of the LAN information because there are a few things you need to set up associated with the LAN uh, to uh, to really have a, a, a properly working UCS environment. You know, as I stated at the very beginning of this video, UCS is poorly named. It says Unified Compute System, but really what it is is Unified Networking for a Compute System. And this is where kind of some of the magic comes in, in addition to VNIX because you have the ability to, at a fabric level um, or at a overall environment level, define what your VLANs are, um, where, what LAN, what, you know, where you're pinning things. So these LAN pin groups, you can tell it, you know, um, pin all of my traffic on this LAN, you know, to, uh, to this interface. And you can route things much, in a much more complicated fashion than you could in really anything else that I've seen. Um, really gives you a lot of detailed control over the network and over how things are working um, because you know and, and it enables a, a different level of network virtualization uh, which is really really cool um, the really important ones in here though are um, defining a LAN pin group so you want to define which connection is the main connection for uh, your LAN and then on VLANs you want to define um, what your VLANs are in which VLAN is native now, of course, the native VLAN being the one that packets are going to be tagged as uh, going outbound from the devices. Oh, lastly, one other thing I almost forgot. Um, the K you, you have um, options for from UCS manager for, like I said, everything that you have in SIMC, um, including the KVM console that we looked at previously and the uh, uh, this SSHing into SIMC. So you can come and it's even simpler because you don't even have this other file that downloads that you have to mess with, it just launches it. Um, you've got your KVM that pops up, 
and you have all of the options that you had when like with virtual media except they're all right there in the window which i think is a lot nicer but you can activate your virtual devices and connect media to you know map a cd map a removable disk map a floppy um so and you got all your macros it's really just real simple you got your quick buttons at the top and then you've got all your server details on another tab if for some reason while you're managing it you need to do something with it i this this right here this kvm console management so i can you know being able to quickly pop between kvms for servers um come on server one uh is is really nice for me um i think it makes it so much simpler when you're managing things uh not having to to you know go to diff a different web page for a different server to connect to a different kvm um you know just being able to have them you know boom right there next to each other and being able to have full um, control of the server right there from the KVM console is really, really nice. You can see we're booting the server. We get everything from, you know, from cold to, um, you know, within the operating system. It shows you the entire boot process and you have full KVM access the whole time. It's really nice. Um, and this, this to me is the real, one of the really nice things in a home lab setting about having SimC, um, you know, or having UCS manager, you know, forget, forget some of the higher level stuff that you can do in terms of like broadly managing and managing at scale for a large number of servers. This being able to manage, um, get into my, my KVMs quickly, not have to, you know, keep track of, you know, oh, what was the IP for this one? What was the IP for that one? Let me static map them. Let me, you know, put DNS entries for my management interfaces. No, it's all right here. It's all within UCS manager. I have one DNS entry for UCSM to access all my servers. And that to me is the real, the real benefit and nice thing about UCS. We're gonna leave it there. We're gonna hop back over and we're gonna close this guy out. All right, so now let's actually get down to brass tacks. Is everything that we've talked about here, running a UCS environment in your home lab practical? Um, that's kind of really a double-edged question. First, from a standalone server standpoint, yes, it is exceedingly practical. You, uh, SIMC is not that hard to learn. Um, it gives you a lot of flexibility and a lot of management options, especially, you know, some of the things you can do, like doing BIOS recovery in the CMOS flash remotely is really cool and really nice and handy. Um, so from that standpoint, yeah, I absolutely think that UCS servers are great in the home lab. Um, also, the pricing on them is amazing right now, especially when every now and then if, uh, when a UCS shop does a, an upgrade, you'll see just a flood of them come on eBay. That's how I got this guy so cheap. But to run a UCSM environment, the, the uh, you know, large scale infrastructure management environment and running UCS servers on that, is that practical? Not so much. Um, I'm doing it right now as I'm playing with it, but is it something that I really want to leave up full time, long term? Eh, uh, you know, guys, it's a lot of power. We're talking over 350 watts of networking for the fabric interconnecting effects. And it's loud. I can hear it on the second floor, on the first floor of my house when I, you know, when I leave it on in the basement. And that's not even like being like right above it in the, second, the next floor of my house. It's like, you know, a room over and above it, I can still hear it. So um, it makes it a lot less practical. And it, unless you have like an outbuilding or something or really cheap power or free power, I'm going to go with, no, you probably don't want to run UCSM in your home lab. Again, then again, everybody's situation is different. Uh, you may not care about the noise. Uh, right now, I don't care too much about the noise because the part of the house you can hear it from is not the most used part of the house. Also, my power is really cheap, so I can kind of get away with it. But long term, I don't think I'm going to leave it up um, as like a, a always on kind of thing. Um, I probably will run these guys in standalone mode and then... Um, you know, just manage them individually using SIMC. That said though, is anything that we do in the home lab really all that terribly practical? I mean, the idea here, at least for me, when I started a home lab was that I wanted to gain as many different skills as I could um, so that I was better prepared for my career, right? And so that was why my video that I did not that long ago on, um, you know, my home lab getting me a job was such a big deal for me because I wanted to grow professionally. And that was where um, my impetus for home labbing came from. And so 
from that standpoint, you know, if maybe I'm looking for like an architect type job or, a, you know, an administration job in the future that is going to have me doing more server administration, you know, you know, and some of it also comes down to how frequently you're going to be running it. I mean, from a price standpoint, setting up a UCSN environment is not horrible. I mean, the Fabric Interconnects are maybe 150 bucks shipped, FX is under $100 shipped. You know, you start to get into more expense with all the little nitty gritties. You know, the, the VIX, the older VIX are about 20 or $30, which is about as cheap as you can get a 10 gigabit NIC for anyway. Um, so it's not that bad um, price-wise. It's just the power consumption is not that great and it's loud. If you can live with those two things, you can run UCS at home. Um, or you can just run it as a lab type thing where you spin it up when you want to use it and you spin it down when you're done with it. That said, the stuff you can do with UCS is really cool. In fact, so um, I had a server that just absolutely refused to post. And I was able to remotely clear the CMOS, remotely flash the BIOS, and get that server back up and running without ever having to leave my desk. Um, so that's really, really cool. And that's really powerful that uh, Cisco has built a server system that is that easily remotely managed. You know, um, adding servers also is incredibly fast. You know, like we've talked about with the UCS, uh, with the profiles in UCS Manager, um, you can bring a server in, put it in your environment, apply a profile to it, and you know, be installing an OS and ready to go in 15 or 20 minutes. That's not necessarily maybe in the home lab or type spirit because you know we have more fun fiddling and playing with things. But if you are just wanting to replace a server and get it up as fast as possible, man, this is the way to go. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, go ahead and click that like button down below. If you have any comments or questions for me, uh, have uh, other information you wanna know about UCS, throw it in the comments section. Um, if you have any particular projects you think would be fun to do with that virtual networking layer, uh, let me know and I'll see if I can cook something up with it. If you'd like to support my channel, you can do so by using the Amazon or eBay affiliate links in the description section. Um, if you wanna pick up a UCS server for yourself, um, uh, go ahead and use that affiliate link if you don't mind because that really helps support the channel and enables me to do more cool stuff. Thanks for watching guys. We'll see you on the next one.